Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 2009. We're going to be taking a look at the Pretenders and we're going to be focusing on Chrissy Hind and they're going to be playing through Brass in Pocket. So let's get Chrissy and the guys up on screen and see how they get on. I got bottom, I'm gonna use it in tension have it. I thought I'd let this video run all the way through because we only had a minute left and I was going to jump in. But another example of a unique artist, late 70s, 79 is when this track was actually released, the end of 79. And 30 years on, the thing that I want to point out about this video initially is the way that Chrissy's voice is exactly the same as 30 years ago and if anything in my opinion it has improved because I've seen other live performances of Brass in Pocket where the vocal hasn't been as solid as this performance so I think maybe throughout the years obviously playing so much singing so much is going to improve the voice but also I think at some point Chrissy has worked on her voice maybe got a bit of tuition in order to be a little bit more accurate and be able to control the pitch a little bit more but this is a really solid performance vocally throughout of Brass in Pocket it's really impressive considering that it's 30 years after it was initially released it's something that I say in other videos about singers who have to do watered down versions of their tracks and and they'll change the key of their tracks to cope with their fatigued vocal cords but this is still the same key by the way and Chrissy's one of those artists that has that triple threat of being able to sing being able to play an instrument and being able to write songs because she is the main songwriter for the pretenders and is the only one that has been there since the beginning and when you've got somebody who is the singer and plays an instrument and writes all the songs that tends to be the case that that person 
person. As long as they stay there, the band are going to keep their sound, and that's certainly the case with Chrissy. And when I mention about composing and writing this song in particular, what we've got in this performance, and you might have spotted it, if it doesn't quite feel the same as the recorded version, we've got what I refer to in other videos as pushing the tempo. And all that means is playing a song slightly too fast. And I'm a massive fan of the songwriter counting in the band so that you get an accurate representation of the tempo straight off the bat rather than maybe leaving it to another band member who won't know the composition as intimately as you do because you've written it yourself. So I think it would have been great here if Chrissy had maybe give an account in herself so that we could get that groove because it does sit slightly slower on the recorded version and that's something that you'll notice even if you're not aware of the tempo being pushed being slightly too fast you'll start to feel it within yourself that something isn't quite sitting in there and the groove just is affected by the fact that it's too fast and it just needed to be held back a little bit but this is the kind of thing that can happen live and when I mentioned mentioned a minute ago about Chrissy having that triple threat, she's got another string to her bow, which is being a designated front woman of the band and selling it as a front woman, because some players who have that comfort of playing a guitar and singing, as soon as you take that guitar out of the equation, they become very self-conscious about not having that safety net of being hidden behind that guitar. And Chrissy's a great example of someone who plays the guitar, but get rid of that and she can entertain a crowd and get them involved. And this is certainly something that Madonna said early on that she went to see the Pretenders and Chrissy in 1980 and she was hit by the showmanship that Chrissy had, her confidence, and it's something that really inspired her as an artist to be confident on stage. And just breaking down this song and this performance, it sounds like we've got a little bit of pedal steel guitar in there as well, which is nice to hear. And the composition, there isn't a lot to it. We've got quite a clean rhythm guitar, which is mostly playing the fills, and we've got the riff, of course, but then the bass line is what is going to be changing what we're perceiving to be the key as we're moving down. The drum kit, obviously, is a massive part of this being really solid on the original track. Tempo a little bit pushed, like I mentioned, but we've got that focal point of Chrissy's melody and the way that she delivers that vocal. Because of the attitude and the expression that Chrissy delivers it with, it doesn't really matter. It's something I mentioned again in other videos about auto-tune and the fact that the expression and the connection comes from that human element of not always being perfectly on pitch. And Chrissy's a great example of that and a great example of somebody who grew up just wanting to be in bands the whole time and didn't have classical training with vocals. It was just something that she learned to do herself. And I think really through necessity of not having a front man in a particular band and just deciding to do the vocals one night, but something that she really must have enjoyed and liked being the center of attention. And I think for her, she just got a kick out of being in a band, full stop. That was it. She just always wanted to be performing in front of people. And when I talk about Chrissy not having that formal training in singing and playing an instrument, she's a great example of someone who just worked at it, was persistent, and just had that drive to be in bands. And I think it's something within her that just made her keep pushing forward because in 1970 she went to university and in 1973 is when she moved to London and that's a huge thing to do in the first place. She started working for the New Musical Express a magazine here, NME, if you know what that is, and unfortunately that didn't really work out. So she went to a clothes shop and that was run by Malcolm McLaren and a woman called Vivian Westwood and it wasn't a huge shop at the time because we 
we're talking early to mid 70s here. And this is where we have our link to punk music because listening to Chrissy perform, there is that edge in there. And the link was with Malcolm who owned the shop with Vivian that I just mentioned because he managed the Sex Pistols. And because Chrissy was in the UK from the USA, she asked if Johnny Rotten would marry her so she could get a visa and set up a band and do everything that she wanted to do in the UK and work. But unfortunately, he backed out of it, so she asked Sid Vicious if he would marry her. And they went to the registration office, but unfortunately, it was closed. And the next day, Sid had a court date. So he was due in court, so couldn't go to the registration office. So unfortunately, that plan fell through for Chrissy, but she went to France in order to try and set up a band there. Unfortunately, that didn't come to fruition either. So she moved back to the USA in 1975. But not to be deterred, Chrissy moved back to France in 1976, tried to set up another band there. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. So she went back to London and now the punk movement was really kicking off. And she saw an advert in Melody Maker magazine and went along to an audition. And that was for a band that would then later become 999, which was a punk band. But unfortunately, that didn't work out either. So then her friend Malcolm McLaren stepped in and managed to get her into the band Masters of the Backside and she left that band just before they became The Damned and then she did go on tour, she did join a band and that was called Johnny Moped and she toured with them for a year but after that she wasn't part of that band anymore and she was really deflated because she wanted to be in a band. It was just something that she had the drive to do. So having that experience of being on tour, but then now suddenly not being on tour and not being in a band, I think it really hit her hard. So in 1978, Chrissy is still plugging away and she gives her demo to a guy called Dave Hill who owned Real Records. And Dave really liked this demo and Dave paid Chrissy's rent at the time because she owed for where she was staying. So he said to Chrissy, go and get a band together. So she did and they recorded a demo and they released a single in 1979 and that had Stop Your Sobbing and The Wait. Those were the two tracks on the single and that single got to number 33 in the UK charts. And in November of 1979 is when they released Brass in Pocket. And in January of 1980, this got to number one in the charts. And the album also got to number one in the album charts at exactly the same time. So the self-titled album, The Pretenders, their first release, was a worldwide success. So they released an EP and Pretenders 2 in 1981 and Pretenders 2 did really well as well. That got into the top 10, in fact, number 10 in the US album charts and the previous album, their debut album, got to number 9. So they performed really consistently with those first two albums and in 1982, the band went through some forced personnel changes. Unfortunately, James Honeyman Scott, who was the original guitarist, died from a drugs overdose and that was just a few days after Pete Fonden had been sacked the bass player and unfortunately the next year 1983 Pete Fonden also died from a drugs overdose so it's a really tough time for Chrissy she went about finding replacements and settled on Robbie McIntosh to play guitar and also Malcolm Foster on bass and they got together in the studio and recorded the album Learning to Crawl and and this was 1984 when that was released and that was a huge hit as well. That went platinum in the USA and got to a chart position of number five. And in the mid 80s, there would be more personnel changes because Martin Chambers, the original drummer, he left and that was just before the Get Close album in 1986, which left Chrissy as the only remaining original member of the band. And Martin did join up again in the mid 90s. And Chrissy is one of those artists that has done a lot of collaborations and probably her most famous one was around this same time, 1985, and it was with UB40 and it was the song I Got You Babe and that got to number one here in the UK and it also got to number 28 in the US charts. 
And I just want to mention something about copyrights and publishing to do with Chrissy because EMI found that a guy called Rush Limba was using a part of Chrissy's song or at least an instrumental for My City Was Gone on the intro of his show that he had. We don't get it in the UK here, but they gave him a cease and desist request because they realized that he was using it without permission. But then Chrissy got involved and said, well, my parents really like his show, so I haven't got a problem with it. And they worked out a usage fee and a usage payment in order for him to keep using that on his show. And it worked out really well because that money was donated to charity. And for me, it is a common sense approach to copyright and publishing because Chrissy didn't have a problem with it as the writer of the music and just said, let's work something out and give the money to charity. And I don't want this video to go on for too long, but just to finish with the fact that Chrissy, like I said in the beginning of the video, has a drive and just has to be in a band. It's something that she was so relentless with in order to set up a band and get out there and just write so much material, but also great material because it's a totally different skill set to be a great songwriter than to be a great singer or a great instrumentalist. It's having that ear for melody that is the rarest of things because if everybody could write a great song, everybody would be multi-millionaires. But Chrissy certainly had that ability. So it's no surprise that she's done multiple worldwide tours. She had new albums released in 2002, 2008 and 2016. And she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2005. And we can see from this performance that Chrissy has not been affected by time in any sense, seemingly, because the fantastic performance here. And also, I mentioned about having that punk edge to her performance. And certainly with the makeup, the mascara running down her face, it certainly adds a bit of attitude to that image as well. As recently as 2016, she supported Opened for Stevie Nicks on tour. And just finishing with distinct rock voices and Chrissy's view of that because she has one of those distinct voices and she has said that the most distinct voices in rock are trained throughout years of frustration, fear, loneliness, loads of different things, perseverance as well, and it isn't necessarily learning it from a teacher. It's just the journey that you go through that gives you your own voice, and certainly it has served Chrissy well. That's what has made her into such a unique artist. But thank you so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at, and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think and if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one.